strange phenomena are continuously occurring. Echoing sounds in the sky, a world-shocking event of the century leaves everyone astonished and outraged. Unnatural occurrences happen repeatedly. The land chosen by God also faces a time of crisis. Conflicts and unrest persist, and no one knows what is truly coming. Could this be a warning for the end times? Are these events fulfilling the prophecies in the Bible? Terrifying Sounds from the Sky A strange, low-repeating noise in North St. Louis County makes many people extremely confused and worried. The low rumble sounds like a generator running in the distance. But this is not the first time this sound has appeared on Earth. As recorded by the media, people have received dozens of phone calls and emails from people on both sides of the river who say they hear a strange, low-repeating noise. People became extremely confused and scared because they did not know what terrible thing they were facing. What they can do is constantly share their fears and pray for a clear explanation. When you watch the video, let's listen carefully. Beyond the birds chirping, you can hear the same hum in the background. This sounds so, so low that it's almost inaudible, but super consistent. Usually in the evenings after eight, people in this area would hear a very low humming noise that would come in kind of a wave pattern. Some say that they can hear the hum from North St. Louis County home. Regional authorities have conducted checks around the area to find the source of this mystery sound. When people heard the hum, they would definitely be kind of freaked out and would be looking for some type of explanation for the mysterious sound. When the source of this strange sound could not be found, people thought of another possibility. That was not a sound made by humans or machines, but the sound from the Holy Spirit. Listeners describe them as metallic groans, angelic harmonies and trumpets blaring from the sky. Some say it's a sound from heaven like the roar of rushing waters, or it is the sound of God. For almost a decade, these sounds have been heard all over the world. Many believe the sounds are the trumpets of God's angels, a warning of the end and a sign of God's presence here on earth. It reminds us a time when God made his presence on earth heard. Once to Moses at Mount Sinai, where he gave the people of Israel the Torah, and then again when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus Christ's followers. Some believe the trumpet sounds are the beginning of the end, the end of times, and the opening of the seven seals. There are plenty theories, such as the shifting of tectonic plates, minor earthquakes, changes in the Earth's core, solar flares, aliens, an angry god, and even the sound of an approaching meteor. Strange sounds in the sky, preachers prophesying the end of the world, hundreds of birds falling from the sky, droughts, solar flares, and rumors of an impending meteor impact. Could the trumpet-like sounds be the coming of the apocalypse? Revelation 4, 1 After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Could these sounds be the voice of angels bringing about the last days and a return of Christ to earth? Many people believe that this hum is the sound of a trumpet. But some people object, saying that the trumpet's sound will be louder and clearer while the hum is low, feeling like it is suppressing something. But those who have the opinion that it is a trumpet think differently. They say that, although this sound is not clearly the sound of a trumpet, but because you cannot hear it clearly, how do you know it is not the sound of a trumpet? Maybe it's letting us hear it in a different form. If this is truly the sound of a trumpet, then it is very likely that this is a sign of the last days. The most probable explanations for the sky trumpets, biblically, would be that they are either natural or man-made. Whether these unidentified sounds are the work of pranksters, the effect of changes to our planet's magnetic field, or the evidence of a sinister global plot, 
the fact remains that we just don't know. No one knows for sure what part, if any, sky trumpets will have in the end times. We do know this. The days before the rapture will be characterized by increasing wickedness and widespread false teaching. After the rapture, the deception and wickedness will grow even worse. The only way to escape this confusion is to be born again and live in hope of the imminent coming of Jesus Christ for the Church. Olympic Opening Ceremony The opening ceremony, held on the Seine River, featured 6,800 athletes parading along a 6-kilometer route with 85 boats and was followed worldwide through live performances and televised broadcasts. The parade down the River Seine featured plenty of eye-catching moments that sparked online fervor, including one now particularly infamous scene that outraged many Christians who lambasted its resemblance to Leonardo da Vinci's famed Last Supper painting. In the performance broadcast during the ceremony, a woman wearing a silver halo-like headdress stood at the center of a long table, with drag queens posing on either side of her. Later, at the same table, a giant cloche lifted, revealing a man, nearly naked and painted blue, on a dinner plate surrounded by fruit. He broke into a song as, behind him, the drag queens danced. Some strongly expressed the view that the Last Supper performance during the opening ceremonies of the Paris Olympics was not art, it was satanic warfare and mental illness on full display. Many people believe this is nothing short of mockery. The Bible tells us that one of the signs of the last days is that people will go out of their way to blaspheme God. That will be a distinguishing characteristic of the Antichrist, whom the Scripture says will blaspheme God. Even as God's judgment is falling on non-believers during the tribulation, Revelation 16.9 says, And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Blasphemy represents the conscious denouncing and rejection of God. It is a defiant irreverence, the sin of intentionally and openly speaking evil against God. To commit this sin does not merely represent unbelief, but determined unbelief. One of the signs leading up to the end times is the sign of mockers, who will come, following after their own lusts, taunting Christians with words of doubt, denying the promise of his second coming. Peter, moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote about this mockers in end times in his second letter, but it was also alluded to by Jesus himself in several parables he told about his return. Paris's Olympic ceremony provides a lurid example of how many people, organizations, companies, and leaders of Western societies today push values they call love, inclusion, diversity, tolerance, and freedom. Their overarching thoughts can be summarized as, everyone can do whatever they want. The only boundary is that boundaries must not be set. Accept everyone for who they are, how they choose to live. This is nothing new. In fact, it has been quite common in history. For instance, ancient Israel's period of judges is characterized with this statement. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. As opposed to what was right in God's eyes. God distinguishes right from wrong, specifically by setting boundaries that the Bible describes in great detail. Where sin is concerned, God is a God of exclusion. The Bible expresses repeatedly that God, in His eternal kingdom, will categorically exclude every form of sin, many of which were depicted and celebrated in Paris's opening ceremony. And not only will God exclude sinful behavior from His kingdom, he will exclude people who are not willing to seek God's forgiveness and repent of such behavior. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. The book of Revelation gives much detail about the wrath of Almighty God, which will one day be poured upon mankind. 
Until then, sincere Christians must sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done while striving to deliver one of the Bible's central messages, turn from wickedness to righteousness. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. A message to humanity, to be aware of the deceivers and liars and the wolves in the sheep clothing. In the face of this ridicule, Jesus coached his disciples, teaching them the importance of responding with love, truth, and patience. He made sure they knew that not everyone would cheer for their team or welcome their plays. He prepared them for the haters they might encounter. Jesus encouraged them to stand firm in their faith and share the gospel with the spirit of a true athlete, with gentleness, respect, and the love of the game. Jesus Christ has a name above every other name. He is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and unrepentant sinners do not want to bow to King Jesus. Oh, but one day they will. All mockers and scoffers will bow to Jesus on Judgment Day. For all of you who are in the wrong way, are mocking and scoffing at God, let's turn to Christ and live. Folks, we've all sinned against God. The Bible says that we go away from God from the womb. This makes sense. You do not have to teach a child how to be bad. As soon as a baby can crawl or a toddler walks, they will disobey you. You tell a baby or toddler not to do something. More times than not, they will smile at you and then they will crawl or walk right over and do exactly what you told them not to do. We are born with a sinful nature. Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden and we've all sinned since then. That's why we need a savior. Left to our own devices, we only sow sin and corruption. We sow for fleshly desires. If Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior, then all you are working for tonight is death. Physical death and the second death and the second death is everlasting punishment. We don't want you to die in your sins and go to hell. Apocalyptic Dubai floods. Shake the city. Most recently, nature seems to have shown its anger in Dubai, causing panic among the entire population. More than just a regular phenomenon, many people are concerned about the true meaning behind it. Rain is unusual in the UAE, an arid Arabian Peninsula nation. Heavy rainfall over the desert landscape of the Gulf is not unheard of, and residents were warned via a public alert system. But Dubai's weather infrastructure was unprepared for the worst rain since 1949. The United Arab Emirates has announced that this is the worst storm to ever hit the country. This is a rare phenomenon in an arid place like Dubai, sparking curiosity and surprise among the residents. Jesus Christ said that end-time events would be like those during the days of Noah. Discussing the time near his return to earth, Jesus declared, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It appears people thought they were living normal lives during the time Noah lived, just before the flood. They were oblivious to the impending disaster. So what was Jesus talking about? When God brought a universal flood upon the earth to destroy all mankind, only Noah and his family were spared. Peter states that God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. These eight people included Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their sons' wives. Since Jesus said that the last days would parallel the society of Noah's day, we can look further into God's word to learn what he meant. The book of Genesis explains what conditions were like at that time. Not long after God placed human beings on earth, mankind refused to follow the good and beneficial instructions of God that would have led to stable, happy lives. Instead, they quickly headed towards self-destruction. Following Adam and Eve's example of rejecting God's instructions, humanity became increasingly hostile and corrupt. By the time of Noah, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. 
Because of this, God said that he was sorry that he had created mankind and told Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. God's grieving was not sorrow for making a mistake. God doesn't make mistakes. God gave his human creation the freedom to choose between right and wrong, and he was grieved in his heart to see how far humanity had fallen from what he originally intended. Jesus referred to the days of Noah when he was describing what conditions would be like just prior to his return. His point was that people would be unaware of his return to judge mankind. Sadly, the vast majority of the earth's inhabitants will be living ungodly lives in a world filled with violence when this monumental event occurs. In his Olivet Discourse, Jesus described what would be happening on earth before his second coming. The signs of the end of this age include lawlessness abounding, the gospel of the kingdom being preached, and Jerusalem being surrounded by armies. The Apostle Paul confirmed that before Christ's return, the world would have perilous times, filled with pleasure-seeking, materialism, immorality, violence, idleness, and a rejection of the things of God. A major reason for God's bringing the Great Flood was that the earth was filled with violence. Indeed, things are changing in the world. Jesus Christ said, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. We are currently living in an age where these vices are becoming more commonplace. Is it now happening in Dubai? As the violence of this age increases, God's message becomes more fitting. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Therefore the land will mourn, and everyone who dwells there will waste away. Dubai surprised the whole world is the stunning creation of oil wealth since the discovery of crude in 1966. In the coastal waters of Dubai, there are two man-made neighborhoods dredged up into the shape of palm tree branches, with homes and businesses being built in rows along each branch. Nearby, there is a map of the world composed of man-made islands. They are for sale. While Dubai's economy was built on oil and natural gas, it now relies on tourism, trade, and real estate to keep the money flowing. There are spectacular malls throughout the city. One of them has an indoor ski slope with real snow, 6,000 tons produced daily. Dubai is considered the fifth safest city in the world. There are no personal or income taxes in Dubai. These are amazing facts about this country. But greater yet is what God is doing among his people. Proselytizing is against the law in the UAE. But what that means in essence is, you can't pay someone to convert or unduly coerce them to change religions. But speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ abounds. There are many Christian churches. Therefore, the gospel sounds forth weekly in Dubai. And on the university campuses, there are organizations that aggressively seek to speak to students about what the Bible really teaches. Wars and Rumors of Wars This is probably the most clearly visible sign at the present time. Worldwide, diplomatic efforts to end fighting are failing. More leaders are pursuing their ends militarily. Around the globe, more people are dying in fighting, being forced from their homes or in need of life-saving aid than in decades. Major powers have strong incentives not to fight each other, but more conflicts are raging and tensions mounting along the world's most perilous fault lines. Ukraine, the Red Sea, Taiwan, and the South China Sea among them. The world is becoming chaotic, and the relationships between nations are growing increasingly tense. This is clearly stated in the Bible. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. Many people will mock this prophecy and say that there is always war in the world. This is extremely normal. 
Since the fall of man in the Garden of Eden wars, and rumors of wars have gone on, but never to the degree that we are seeing right now. In a technical sense, the end times began when Jesus ascended to heaven. When the Lord said there would be birth pains, he intentionally used the image of a woman's labor while giving birth. Labor is an undetermined amount of time. Some births go faster than others, and some are more intense than others, so it is unpredictable about when exactly a baby will arrive. However, contractions get stronger and stronger. Understanding the signs of the end times like labor, in a technical sense, every war and rumor of war is a sign of the end times. They are a reminder that this earth is groaning for Jesus' return, that his return is inevitable, and that man's wickedness will only increase without the Lord and to put hope and faith in him, not in man. No one person can predict what war, disease, or event may set off the events that will trigger the return of the Lord. Anyone who comes forward claiming that he or she can predict the day is a liar and deceiver. The Father has chosen to keep that knowledge secret. Today's wars are part of the heralding of the end of days, though the second coming may be far off in time, or it may be today. The Bible encourages believers to be ready and challenges unbelievers to prepare themselves and try to pursue a relationship with Jesus Christ, because He will return. The Second Coming and the Judgment Day, though some theologians may disagree about when they will happen, are going to happen. One day Jesus will return in His full power and glory, and it is the job of the Christian to serve Him and pursue a relationship with Him, and tell the world about the gift of salvation so that everyone has an opportunity to know God and have faith. Then, rather than getting caught up obsessing about the end of days, arguing about whose interpretation of the end times events is correct, or ignoring it altogether, Christians should remember daily their Savior could return at any moment, rejoice, and evangelize. On battlefields, though, it's tougher. More a matter of spotting opportunities to halt fighting and mitigate suffering as they arise and redoubling efforts to stop conflicts spreading. That almost certainly means accepting flawed bargains between belligerents as better than protracted war-making and working with those involved to make agreements more likely to endure. It makes little sense today to shut out those who, whether on the ground or from afar, are behind violence but also essential to winding it down. Ideally, World leaders would also give supposedly frozen conflicts the attention they need before it's too late. Rain and snow to Israel Some incredible things are happening in Israel right now. This promised land is greeted with a lot of snow and rain. It's not exactly a normal natural phenomenon. Huge rainfall created rivers, which did not exist. And of course, rain in the desert is a miracle that transforms death into life. Before learning about what has been happening in Israel, let's take a look at the geographical location of this sacred land. Might be you've heard of Mount Hermon. In the Hebrew Bible, Mount Hermon constituted part of the northern border of the Promised Land, and in the Book of Enoch, it is the site of the descent of the fallen angels when they determined to take human wives on earth. In the New Testament, it is a likely candidate for the so-called Mount of Transfiguration. Particularly for Israel, Mount Hermon is also known as the Eyes of the Nation because its altitude makes it Israel's primary strategic early warning system. The summit of Mount Hermon is on the border between Syria and Lebanon and is under Syrian control. The southern slopes of the mountain came under Israeli control following the Six-Day War in 1967. The mountain represents a crucial geographical resource as the source of the Jordan River. It is also the strategic high ground overlooking Lebanon, Syria, and Israel. It can be seen that Mount Hermon plays quite an important role in Israel. And look, at the top of Mount Hermon, it's all snow, FYI. Mount Hermon has seasonal snow, which covers all three of its peaks for most of the year, especially in winter and spring. Meltwater from the snow-covered mountains' western and southern bases seeps into the rock channels and pores, feeding springs at the mountain's base, 
forming streams and rivers. Water flows down the Kinneray, the Sea of Galilee. From here, the water continues to flow down to the Dead Sea and across the Jordan River. Also, the same thing happened in the Judean Desert. Jerusalem is built on a hill. When it rains in the Jerusalem area, water from those mountains flows down through the valleys and also flows into the Judean Desert. When this happens, water quickly accumulates in those valleys and rivers are very rapidly created. Now this is something that reminds us of the future events that will happen in the future and of which we can read in the book of Zechariah chapter 14. When the Savior of Israel comes, and when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, the mountain will split, and a valley will be created in the middle. Let's take a look at verse 4. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives east of Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives will be split in two from east to west, forming a great valley, with half of the mountain moving north and half moving south. Additionally, we read in verse 8 that on that day, Living water will flow out of Jerusalem. Half of the water will go to the Dead Sea, and the other half to the Mediterranean. Also, we'll read that on that day, everybody will know that the God of Israel is king over the whole earth. According to the book of Zechariah, the whole mountain will split. One part of the mountain will go to the north, and the other one to the south. In Zechariah 14, the prophet proclaims that the Mount of Olives will be split in half and the Israelites will flee through it. In an earlier vision, Zechariah had already seen four chariots come out from behind two bronze mountains, presumably by passing between them. In chapter 47 of the book of Ezekiel, we read that Ezekiel was shown waters that came down from under from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. The house referred to was the temple that will be built at Jerusalem after Christ returns. Within two kilometers of the temple, the water that came from the aquifer was a gushing stream flowing east from the temple down through the Judean wilderness to the Dead Sea. Zechariah also tells us that when Christ returns, the Mount of Olives, which is on the east of Jerusalem, will split and become a great valley running east-west and that Living means fresh waters shall go out from Jerusalem. It will be through this valley that these waters will flow. Israel already has a mountain aquifer, and until recently it supplied one-third of the nation's water. This is a remarkable aquifer, because Jerusalem and Hebron are the highest mountains in Israel, yet the water rushes through what is known as Hezekiah's tunnel sometimes knee-deep. It is thought the waters bubbling up at Jerusalem are fed from melting snows as far away as eastern Turkey. Much of Israel is limestone country, and there are many caves through which the waters might flow. The earthquake that splits the Mount of Olives when Christ returns will no doubt intersect this aquifer and supply the fresh waters that will increase through the Judean wilderness for 33 kilometers down to the Dead Sea. So great will the flow of water become that the salty waters of the Dead Sea will become fresh and rise all the way up the Jordan Valley to the Sea of Galilee. He Sea of Galilee is 225 mammalers below sea level, and the Dead Sea is much lower at 387 mammalers below sea level. The Dead Sea is about 323 mammalers deep and is the deepest lake in the world. It is nearly 10 times as salty as the oceans. No fish can survive in the waters of the Dead Sea, and if humans drink it, they will die. Yet the volume of fresh water that will flow from the temple at Jerusalem after Christ returns will be so great that they will sweeten the waters of the Dead Sea to such an extent that men will catch fish there. The Jordan Valley will become a fresh water lake from Engedi to Eneglame, north of the Sea of Galilee. We know where Engedi is located on the western shores of the Dead Sea. At En Gedi, there is a waterfall of fresh water that flows out from beneath the Judean desert, from Israel's mountain aquifer. The water source that Ezekiel saw is already there. It just needs the Mount of Olives to split. God told Ezekiel, I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing, and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing, and the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase.